Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter but not the spirit of request. And today we have three great stories, so subscribe, hit the like button, and let's begin. The first story, man refused my first aid and then thanked me for saving his life. The second story, chief ordered to tie and glue everything on the ship for safety. We did it. The third story, Coach said to pay attention for the shove. After that, I removed his player from the field. The first story is, Can I help you now? Another first aid related story, hurrah. Though on this occasion, I used malicious compliance to help people rather than inconvenience them. So it's a benevolent compliance, I guess. To fully understand this story, we have to understand the Good Samaritan laws in Canada. These laws can pretty much be the malicious compliance of a first aider's utility belt as it allows us to help people who don't want to be helped. Good Samaritan laws offer legal protection to people who give reasonable assistance to those who are, or whom they believe to be, injured, ill, in peril, or otherwise incapacitated. These laws in Canada protect you while you're performing first aid and something that all volunteer first responders should be familiar with. However, there are a lot of nuances involving the Good Samaritan laws that you're required to follow. For example, much of the wording within the law is worded specifically so that you still require certification to perform the first aid. If you screw up while performing first aid and don't have proper certification, you can be held liable. Another instance where the Good Samaritan laws come into play is that in best interest of the plaintiff is commonly used. Some of the first things you do as a first aider when you arrive on a scene is ensure it is safe for you to be there, attract attention, and introduce yourself to the victim. Hi, my name is Cole Carmet, and I'm a first responder. Can I help you? Get the heck out of my face. I don't need your help, says the person on the ground with an amputated leg and losing an extraordinary amount of blood. Now, in the law's eye, that person has stated that it is in his best interest to lie on the ground and bleed out. There are some things that can overrule this such as a medical alert bracelet with do not resuscitate, such as a guardian saying otherwise, but at that point my hands are tied. Most I can do is call an ambulance and possibly follow the person, but I cannot help directly help that person. Unless, of course, the situation changes. If the person falls unconscious, you're good to go in most situations. Again, there are rare occasions that I personally never encountered where you still can't help the person, but I can't recall them. While the person is unconscious, even if they fell unconscious after telling you they don't want help, the law assumes it is that person's best interest to help him. Keep in mind this event happened 10 years ago, so things may have changed since then. This is the part the malicious compliance comes into play. In most situations, you know the person is only going to worsen his condition. You could continue to insist that you help him, or you could just wait for the inevitable to happen. Sometimes the latter is required to not worsen the situation, or put yourself or others in harm's way. This leads to some rather interesting situations. Me is me, the first aider assisting me. There's the security of the park, the patient, and the girlfriend of the patient. Everything is recorded on tape, since I have horrible bad handwriting. Rather than writing a patient care sheet, I would provide the paramedics with a voice recording of events. It's not as efficient, as I need to find a chance to transfer the recording, but it's leagues better than my actual unreadable handwriting, especially under stress. A lot of the time, it's just as easy to stop by the hospital or ambulance depot to pick up my recorder from them if I was alone or have a bystander write the patient care sheet for me. As such, the events are fairly accurate, despite this occurring 10 years ago. I keep all my recordings just in case something comes up. The scene was at a public campsite, some distance away from civilization. I was technically not on duty. I was on vacation, but someone called for help at one of the camp lots. I arrived and found a man, probably late twenties, at the base of a tree, blood coming from his head and a large gash down his arm. I asked the lady what happened, and she explained her boyfriend fell out of the tree while he was hanging up a tarp to protect from an upcoming storm. At this point I realized two things, A. Possible head and spinal injury, secure the head immediately. B. Girlfriend is not on the list of people who can give me permission to assist this person. Another first aider showed up at this point, and I went to introduce ourselves. Me. Hi, my name is Cole Carmet, and this is first aider. We're first responders. Can we help you? Patient. No, I can handle this myself. Girlfriend, just let them help. I saw his card. Patient, no, just let me lie here and collect myself. Me, okay, well, if it's okay with you, girlfriend, can we stay nearby in case things get worse? Girlfriend, of course. 
Girlfriend went and boiled some water for hot chocolate and coffee for me and first aider, giving us constant updates of patient's condition. Seems she had some first aid training too, but only the bare bones. First aider ran to use the public phone to call an ambulance. During the time first aider was gone, patient fell unconscious. I went up to him and asked the unconscious body, can I help you now? No response. I start working. I showed the girlfriend how to secure the head properly, as first aider was still not back, and started looking for more injuries. There was also a puncture wound on his hip, but it was superficial compared to everything else. I started with the head, as the injury seemed more severe, and made a bandana out of a towel. Five minutes later there's a gut-wrenching scream. What the frick are you doing? I turn around and saw that patient had woken up. Girlfriend is trying to calm him down and stop his head from moving, but he was fuming. Patient, I told you I didn't need any help. I'm fine. Girlfriend, you're not thinking straight. Insert lovey-dovey stuff here. Me, sir, please stop moving. We don't know if your neck or spine is broken. Patient, okay, fine. I won't move, but take this D scarf off my head. I look like a racist slur. Oh, great. The last thing I wanted to deal with. Me, are you sure? You're bleeding pretty badly. The patient started cussing and swearing. I have my rights. I'll have you arrested and charged, etc, etc. So I removed the bandage. Blood started flowing freely from the wound again, and already his face was getting paler. It was at that point First Aider arrived with security. First Aider, ambulance will be roughly half an hour. How is... Patient, you called a frickin' ambulance? Security, please sir, calm down. You could aggravate your condition. This guy wasn't being picked up well on the recording. Patient, frick that, I'm not paying for that. Me, it doesn't cost anything for them to perform an examination on you. Patient, you're not making me. At that point there's a brief pause in the recording, and my voice comes over. Me, my name is Cole Carmet and I'm a medical first responder. Can I help? Can you hear me? Patient attempted to violently move his head. He immediately fell unconscious, restarting first aid. First aider, can you secure the head? Security, can you get an AED just in case? Girlfriend, in your first aid kit there was a booklet. Get that and copy down what I tell you. At that point I guess I turned off the recording as that was the end of it. I remember the patient started fading into and out of consciousness, each time flying into a fit when he woke up. We just stood back and let him have his temper tantrum before he went back unconscious. When the ambulance arrived, he had been unconscious at that point for 10 minutes, so we thought he was down for the count. Come to find out, he was from the USA, where medical bills were insane, hence the reason why patient was so insistent on not getting help. He thought I was going to charge him for my first aid. I didn't even think that was a thing. I was just doing it because I knew how to. Me and the girlfriend stayed in contact via email for a short while. He was diagnosed with a concussion and internal bleeding. There was a chance he was going to suffer permanent damage, but he managed to pull through. He later on apologized to behavior, but I just brushed it off. You do stupid things while you're suffering from trauma, so I told him it wasn't his fault. I still have a card the pair sent as a thank you. Thanks for being stubborn enough to save my life. I don't think I saved the guy's life, but I do think it could have been worse than it was. The next story is... I'll show you how secure I can make this ship. I was a military member in the Navy. The ship I got posted to was a ship that sailed a lot. Before leaving for any sails, we had to make sure that our ship was secured for sea. Basically, you don't want stuff flying around the ship when you get in the ocean, so everything has to be tied down and secured. After doing this constantly for a year or so, our crew got pretty good at doing this. Our original chief was always happy with the work, maybe a few minor issues, never had any complaints, and let us do the rest of the work to get the ship ready for sail. Our main job was tax. Unfortunately, our chief retired, and he was replaced with a real hard A. We had a two-month trip coming up in a week, and our chief informed us that he wanted our spaces to be secured ASAP. I informed guys about the secure for C on that Monday, and they worked on this all day. On Tuesday, our chief came in the office, telling us it wasn't to his satisfaction, gave us a blast of SH about the quality of work, and wanted us to keep working on it. Every single morning, we were never to his satisfaction. It was at a point where all our pens were velcroed to something, but still not to his satisfaction, but he wasn't telling us what to fix. He told us on Friday that he expected us to complete this while at sea Monday night. Over the weekend, a couple of us had to stay and work on some of the equipment. We were talking about the whole secure for sea issue. Then I pointed out that all the spaces were completely secure except for one. Our department's chiefs and PO's office, usually they took care of this, so we decided to help them out and secure their office for them. I mean, why not? I have to work over the weekend. We grabbed a roll of rope and grabbed a full pack of duct tape. We tied and taped anything we could find, their jackets, their computers, including keyboard and mouse, their chairs, etc. It took us about a half a day of two guys to secure everything in that small office, 
and we made sure it was over the top. One of our PO2s even walked in on us taping everything, and he laughed and said they deserve it, and just walked away. We even took an old pen holder, filled it with old dried up pens, and filled up the pen holder with glue, just to make sure they wouldn't say that we're wasting consumables, and we hid the good pen holder with pens. On Monday morning, we were leaving for that sale. Everybody had to be on ship at 0730. I was standing outside of the office waiting to debrief my boss about the work we did over the weekend and to tell him if there's anything our captain needs to be aware of about the maintenance and testing we completed. While waiting for my boss, our chief shows up. His first words were, what the F? One of our POs walks in and starts laughing. Our chief looked at him and the PO said, I guess this space is secured for C while laughing. After a week at sea, we were still hearing our chief and PO1 swearing about stuff they needed being taped or tied up. We didn't get into any trouble and he backed off. After a few months at sea with us, he started to slow down the hard A roll and he was a great supervisor. The last story is, look for the shove, thanks for bringing it to my attention. I'm a soccer referee when there's not a pandemic happening. I also work high school matches and one of those matches ended up having a delightful example of malicious compliance. For those not in the USA, high school soccer uses a different but similar set of rules from the well-known laws of the game. These rules are looked down upon as a bastard child of the laws, but well, we're kind of stuck with them, so it is what it is. Early in a girls varsity match, away team has a corner kick. I position myself at the top of the arc, which is outside the penalty area. Lots of bodies in the scrum, I don't see anything foul worthy, and the ball is cleared. Away coach is going bananas, claiming that an opponent shoved his player in the back and wants a penalty. I'm not giving a penalty there because while I did see the alleged shove, it was not anywhere near the landing zone of the ball from the corner kick, so not directly involved with the play. And it was not nearly hard enough to cause the player to do anything other than take an extra step forward in the direction she was already headed. But part of being a referee means you have to do a little man management. Let the player and coach know you've heard them, acknowledge that you're human, and make sure that they're aware you'll be on the lookout for whatever it was going forward. Because sometimes, the coaches just want someone to vent their frustrations to. Okay coach, I must have missed it, I'll look for it next time. Coach seems satisfied and goes back to his bench. Near the end of the first half, home team now has a corner kick. This time, I've repositioned myself at the top of the penalty area and closer to the kicker's side of the field, so I'm looking directly into the impending scrum. Ball comes in, home player leaps in the air for the ball, and an away player gives her a two-handed shove in the back, causing her to collide with and land on the goalkeeper. Foul called, clock stopped, penalty kick awarded. Away player earns herself a caution, yellow card, which means according to high school rules, she has to leave the field for the time being. Away coach is livid, yelling at me and my assistant referee, who by this time is near the bench. Stuff like, that's not a penalty, she landed on my keeper, and where's her card? Since the clock is stopped, I jog over toward the away bench. Coach, your player has to come off because she's been cautioned. She shoved her opponent in the back, causing her to land on your keeper. That's reckless and that's why she's been cautioned. And I'll remind you that you were the one that pointed out that I needed to watch out for shoves in the back. So, thanks for that. Away coach went in sulk at the end of his bench for the remainder of the half. They would go on to lose the match 3-2. I hope you love this story. Be sure to subscribe if you want to know when the new video comes out.